How does your smartphone know exactly where you are? The answer lies 12,000 miles over your head in an orbiting satellite that keeps time to the beat of an atomic clock powered by quantum mechanics. Whew, let's break that down. First of all, why is it so important to know what time it is on a satellite when location is what we're concerned about? The first thing your phone needs to determine is how far it is from a satellite. Each satellite constantly broadcasts radio signals that travel from space to your phone at the speed of light. Your phone records the signal arrival time and uses it to calculate the distance to the satellite using the simple formula, distance equals c times time, where c is the speed of light and time is how long the signal traveled. But there's a problem. Light is incredibly fast. If we were only able to calculate time to the nearest second, every location on Earth and far beyond would seem to be the same distance from the satellite. So in order to calculate that distance to within a few dozen feet, we need the best clock ever invented. Enter atomic clocks, some of which are so precise that they would not gain or lose a second even if they ran for the next 300 million years. Atomic clocks work because of quantum physics. All clocks must have a constant frequency. In other words, a clock must carry out some repetitive action to mark off equivalent increments of time. Just as a grandfather clock relies on the constant swinging back and forth of a pendulum under gravity, the tick-tock of an atomic clock is maintained by the transition between two energy levels of an atom. This is where quantum physics comes into play. Quantum mechanics says that atoms carry energy, but they can't take on just any arbitrary amount. Instead, atomic energy is constrained to a precise set of levels. We call these quanta. As a simple analogy, think about driving a car onto a freeway. As you increase your speed, you would normally continuously go from, say, 20 miles per hour up to 70 miles per hour. Now, if you had a quantum atomic car, you wouldn't accelerate in a linear fashion. Instead, you would instantaneously jump or transition from one speed to the next. For an atom, when a transition occurs from one energy level to another, quantum mechanics says that the energy difference is equal to a characteristic frequency multiplied by a constant, where the change in energy is equal to a number called Planck's constant times the frequency. That characteristic frequency is what we need to make our clock. GPS satellites rely on cesium and rubidium atoms as frequency standards. In the case of cesium-133, the characteristic clock frequency is 9,192,631,770 hertz. That's 9 billion cycles per second. That's a really fast clock. No matter how skilled a clockmaker may be, every pendulum, wind-up mechanism, and quartz crystal resonates at a slightly different frequency. However, every cesium-133 atom in the universe oscillates at the same exact frequency. So thanks to the atomic clock, we get a time reading accurate to within one billionth of a second and a very precise measurement of the distance from that satellite. Let's ignore the fact that you're almost definitely on Earth. We now know that you're at a fixed distance from the satellite. In other words, you're somewhere on the surface of a sphere centered around the satellite. Measure your distance from a second satellite and you get another overlapping sphere. Keep doing that and with just four measurements and a little correction using Einstein's theory of relativity, you can pinpoint your location to exactly one point in space. So that's all it takes. A multi-billion dollar network of satellites, oscillating cesium atoms, quantum mechanics, relativity, a smartphone, and you. No problem.
It's a common saying that elephants never forget. But these magnificent animals are more than giant walking hard drives. The more we learn about elephants, the more it appears that their impressive memory is only one aspect of an incredible intelligence that makes them some of the most social, creative, and benevolent creatures on Earth. Unlike many proverbs, the one about elephant memory is scientifically accurate. Elephants know every member in their herd, able to recognize as many as 30 companions by sight or smell. This is a great help when migrating or encountering other potentially hostile elephants. They also remember and distinguish particular cues that signal danger, and can recall important locations long after their last visit. But it's the memories unrelated to survival that are the most fascinating. Elephants remember not only their herd companions, but other creatures who have made a strong impression on them. In one case, two circus elephants that had briefly performed together rejoiced when crossing paths 23 years later. This recognition isn't limited to others of their species. Elephants have also recognized humans they've bonded with after decades apart. All of this shows that elephant memory goes beyond responses to stimuli. Looking inside their heads, we can see why. The elephant boasts the largest brain of any land mammal, as well as an impressive encephalization quotient. This is the size of the brain relative to what we'd expect for an animal's body size, and the elephant's EQ is nearly as high as a chimpanzee's. And despite the distant relation, convergent evolution has made it remarkably similar to the human brain, with as many neurons and synapses in a highly developed hippocampus and cerebral cortex. It is the hippocampus strongly associated with emotion that aids recollection by encoding important experiences into long-term memories. The ability to distinguish this importance makes elephant memory a complex and adaptable faculty beyond rote memorization. It's what allows elephants who survived a drought in their youth to recognize its warning signs in adulthood, which is why clans with older matriarchs have higher survival rates. Unfortunately, it's also what makes elephants one of the few non-human animals to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The cerebral cortex, on the other hand, enables problem solving, which elephants display in many creative ways. They also tackle problems cooperatively, sometimes even outwitting the researchers and manipulating their partners. And they've grasped basic arithmetic, keeping track of the relative amounts of fruit in two baskets after multiple changes. The rare combination of memory and problem solving can explain some of elephants' most clever behaviors, but it doesn't explain some of the things we're just beginning to learn about their mental lives. Elephants communicate using everything from body signals and vocalizations to infrasound rumbles that can be heard kilometers away, and their understanding of syntax suggests that they have their own language and grammar. This sense of language may even go beyond simple communication. Elephants create art by carefully choosing and combining different colors and elements. They can also recognize 12 distinct tones of music and recreate melodies. And yes, there is an elephant band. But perhaps the most amazing thing about elephants is a capacity even more important than cleverness, their sense of empathy, altruism, and justice. Elephants are the only non-human animals to mourn their dead, performing burial rituals and returning to visit graves. They have shown concern for other species as well. One working elephant refused to set a log down into a hole where a dog was sleeping, while elephants encountering injured humans have sometimes stood guard and gently comforted them with their trunk. On the other hand, elephant attacks on human villages have usually occurred right after massive poachings or cullings, suggesting deliberate revenge. When we consider all this evidence, along with the fact that elephants are one of the few species who can recognize themselves in a mirror, it's hard to escape the conclusion that they are conscious, intelligent, and emotional beings. Unfortunately, humanity's treatment of elephants does not reflect this, as they continue to suffer from habitat destruction in Asia, ivory poaching in Africa, and mistreatment in captivity worldwide. Given what we now know about elephants, and what they continue to teach us about animal intelligence, it is more important than ever to ensure that what the English poet John Donne described as nature's great masterpiece does not vanish from the world's canvas. 
As 1905 dawned, the soon-to-be 26-year-old Albert Einstein faced life as a failed academic. Most physicists of the time would have scoffed at the idea that this minor civil servant could have much to contribute to science. Yet within the following year, Einstein would publish not one, not two, not three, but four extraordinary papers, each on a different topic that were destined to radically transform our understanding of the universe. The myth that Einstein had failed math is just that. He had mastered calculus on his own by the age of 15, and done well at both his Munich secondary school and at the Swiss Polytechnic, where he studied for a math and physics teaching diploma. But skipping classes to spend more time in the lab and neglecting to show proper deference to his professors had derailed his intended career path. Passed over even for a lab assistant position, he had to settle for a job at the Swiss patent office, obtained with the help of a friend's father. Working six days a week as a patent clerk, Einstein still managed to make some time for physics, discussing the latest work with a few close friends and publishing a couple of minor papers. It came as a major surprise when in March 1905, he submitted a paper with a shocking hypothesis. Despite decades of evidence that light was a wave, Einstein proposed that it could in fact be a particle, showing that mysterious phenomena, such as the photoelectric effect, could be explained by his hypothesis. The idea was derided for years to come, but Einstein was simply 20 years ahead of his time. Wave-particle duality was slated to become a cornerstone of the quantum revolution. Two months later in May, Einstein submitted a second paper this time tackling the centuries-old question of whether atoms actually exist. Though certain theories were built on the idea of invisible atoms, some prominent scientists still believed them to be a useful fiction rather than actual physical objects. But Einstein used an ingenious argument showing that the behavior of small particles randomly moving around in a liquid, known as Brownian motion, could be precisely predicted by the collisions of millions of invisible atoms. Experiments soon confirmed Einstein's model, and atomic skeptics threw in the towel. The third paper came in June. For a long time, Einstein had been troubled by an inconsistency between two fundamental principles of physics. The well-established principle of relativity, going all the way back to Galileo, stated that absolute motion could not be defined. Yet electromagnetic theory, also well-established, asserted that absolute motion did exist. The discrepancy, and his inability to resolve it, left Einstein in what he described as a state of psychic tension. But one day in May, after he had mulled over the puzzle with his friend Michel Besso, the clouds parted. Einstein realized that the contradiction could be resolved if it was the speed of light that remained constant, regardless of reference frame, while both time and space were relative to the observer. It took Einstein only a few weeks to work out the details and formulate what came to be known as special relativity. The theory not only shattered our previous understanding of reality, but would also pave the way for technologies ranging from particle accelerators to the global positioning system. One might think that this was enough, but in September, a fourth paper arrived as a by-the-way follow-up to the special relativity paper. Einstein had thought a little bit more about his theory, and realized it also implied that mass and energy, one apparently solid and the other supposedly ethereal, were actually equivalent. And their relationship could be expressed in what was to become the most famous and consequential equation in history, E equals mc squared. Einstein would not become a world-famous icon for nearly another 15 years. It was only after his later general theory of relativity was confirmed in 1919 by measuring the bending of starlight during a solar eclipse that the press would turn him into a celebrity. 
But even if he had disappeared back into the patent office and accomplished nothing else after 1905, those four papers of his miracle year would have remained the gold standard of startling, unexpected genius. Bob. Morning, Kelly. The tulips look great. Have you ever wondered how your dog experiences the world? Here's what she sees. Not terribly interesting. But what she smells, that's a totally different story. And it begins at her wonderfully developed nose. As your dog catches the first hints of fresh air, her nose's moist, spongy outside helps capture any scents the breeze carries. The ability to smell separately with each nostril, smelling in stereo, helps to determine the direction of the smell's source so that within the first few moments of sniffing, the dog starts to become aware of not just what kinds of things are out there, but also where they're located. As air enters the nose, a small fold of tissue divides it into two separate folds, one for breathing and one just for smelling. The second airflow enters a region filled with highly specialized olfactory receptor cells several hundred millions of them, compared to our five million. And unlike our clumsy way of breathing in and out through the same passage, dogs exhale through slits at the side of their nose, creating swirls of air that help draw in new odor molecules and allow odor concentration to build up over multiple sniffs. But all that impressive nasal architecture wouldn't be much help without something to process the loads of information the nose scoops up. And it turns out that the olfactory system, dedicated to processing smells, takes up many times more relative brain area in dogs than in humans. All of this allows dogs to distinguish and remember a staggering variety of specific scents at concentrations up to 100 million times less than what our noses can detect. If you can smell a spritz of perfume in a small room, a dog would have no trouble smelling it in an enclosed stadium and distinguishing its ingredients to boot. And everything in the street, every passing person or car, any contents of the neighbor's trash, each type of tree, and all the birds and insects in it, has a distinct odor profile telling your dog what it is, where it is, and which direction it's moving in. Besides being much more powerful than ours, a dog's sense of smell can pick up things that can't even be seen at all. A whole separate olfactory system, called the vomeral nasal organ, above the roof of the mouth, detects the hormones all animals, including humans, naturally release. It lets dogs identify potential mates or distinguish between friendly and hostile animals. It alerts them to our various emotional states, and it can even tell them when someone is pregnant or sick. Because olfaction is more primal than other senses, bypassing the thalamus to connect directly to the brain structures involving emotion and instinct, we might even say a dog's perception is more immediate and visceral than ours. But the most amazing thing about your dog's nose is that it can traverse time. The past appears in tracks left by passers-by and by the warmth of a recently parked car or the residue of where you've been and what you've done recently. Landmarks like fire hydrants and trees are aromatic bulletin boards carrying messages of who's been by, what they've been eating, and how they're feeling. And the future is in the breeze, alerting them to something or someone approaching long before you see them. Where we see and hear something at a single moment, a dog smells an entire story from start to finish. In some of the best examples of canine-human collaboration, dogs help us by sharing and reacting to those stories. They can respond with kindness to people in distress or with aggression to threats because stress and anger manifest as a cloud of hormones recognizable to the dog's nose. With the proper training, they can even alert us to invisible threats ranging from bombs to cancer. As it turns out, humanity's best friend is not one who experiences the same things we do, but one whose incredible nose reveals a whole other world beyond our eyes.
How does this music make you feel? Do you find it beautiful? Is it creative? Now, would you change your answers if you learned the composer was this robot? Believe it or not, people have been grappling with the question of artificial creativity alongside the question of artificial intelligence for over 170 years. In 1843, Lady Ada Lovelace, an English mathematician considered the world's first computer programmer, wrote that a machine could not have human-like intelligence as long as it only did what humans intentionally programmed it to do. According to Lovelace, a machine must be able to create original ideas if it is to be considered intelligent. The Lovelace test, formalized in 2001, proposes a way of scrutinizing this idea. A machine can pass this test if it can produce an outcome that its designers cannot explain based on their original code. The Lovelace test is, by design, more of a thought experiment than an objective scientific test, but it's a place to start. At first glance, the idea of a machine creating high-quality original music in this way might seem impossible. We could come up with an extremely complex algorithm using random number generators, chaotic functions, and fuzzy logic to generate a sequence of musical notes in a way that would be impossible to track. But although this would yield countless original melodies never heard before, only a tiny fraction of them would be worth listening to with the computer having no way to distinguish between those which we would consider beautiful and those which we won't. But what if we took a step back and tried to model a natural process that allows creativity to form? We happen to know of at least one such process that has led to original, valuable, and even beautiful outcomes, the process of evolution. And evolutionary algorithms, or genetic algorithms that mimic biological evolution, are one promising approach to making machines generate original and valuable artistic outcomes. So how can evolution make a machine musically creative? Well, instead of organisms, we can start with an initial population of musical phrases. and a basic algorithm that mimics reproduction and random mutations by switching some parts, combining others, and replacing random notes. Now that we have a new generation of phrases, we can apply selection using an operation called a fitness function. Just as biological fitness is determined by external environmental pressures, our fitness function can be determined by an external melody chosen by human musicians or music fans to represent the ultimate beautiful melody. The algorithm can then compare between our musical phrases and that beautiful melody, and select only the phrases that are most similar to it. Once the least similar sequences are weeded out, the algorithm can reapply mutation and recombination to what's left, select the most similar or fitted ones again from the new generation, and repeat for many generations. The process that got us there has so much randomness and complexity built in that the result might pass the Lovelace test. More importantly, thanks to the presence of human aesthetic in the process, we'll theoretically generate melodies we would consider beautiful. But does this satisfy our intuition for what is truly creative? Is it enough to make something original and beautiful? Or does creativity require intention and awareness of what is being created? Perhaps the creativity in this case is really coming from the programmers, even if they don't understand the process. What is human creativity anyways? Is it something more than a system of interconnected neurons, developed by biological algorithmic processes, and the random experiences that shape our lives? Order and chaos, machine and human. These are the dynamos at the heart of machine creativity initiatives that are currently making music, sculptures, paintings, poetry, and more. The jury may still be out as to whether it's fair to call these acts of creation creative. But if a piece of art can make you weep, or blow your mind, or send shivers down your spine, does it really matter who or what created it? The 
onset of cancer usually begins as a solitary tumor in a specific area of the body. If the tumor is not removed, cancer has the ability to spread to nearby organs, as well as places far away from the origin, such as the brain. So how does cancer move to new areas, and why are some organs more likely to get infected than others? The process of cancer spreading across the body is known as metastasis. It begins when cancer cells from the initial tumor invade nearby normal tissue. As the cells proliferate, they spread via one of the three common routes of metastasis, transcoelomic, lymphatic, or hematogenous spread. In transcoelomic spread, malignant cells penetrate the covering surfaces of cavities in our body. These surfaces are known as peritoneum and serve as walls to segment the body cavity. Malignant cells in ovarian cancer, for example, spread through peritoneum, which connects the ovary to the liver, resulting in metastasis on the liver surface. Next, cancerous cells invade blood vessels when they undergo hematogenous spread. As there are blood vessels almost everywhere in the body, malignant cells utilize this to reach more distant parts of the body. Finally, lymphatic spread occurs when the cancer invades the lymph nodes and travels to other parts of the body via the lymphatic system. As this system drains many parts of the body, it also provides a large network for the cancer. In addition, the lymphatic vessels empty into the blood circulation, allowing the malignant cells to undergo hematogenous spread. Once at a new site, the cells once again undergo proliferation and form small tumors known as micrometastases. These small tumors then grow into full-fledged tumors and complete the metastatic process. Different cancers have been known to have specific sites of metastasis. For example, prostate cancer commonly metastasizes to the bone, while colon cancer metastasizes to the liver. Various theories have been proposed to explain the migration pattern of malignant cells. Of particular interest are two conflicting theories. Stephen Paget, an English surgeon, came up with the seed and soil theory of metastasis. The seed and soil theory stated that cancer cells die easily in the wrong microenvironment. Hence, they only metastasize to a location with similar characteristics. However, James Ewing, the first professor of pathology at Cornell University, challenged the seed and soil theory and proposed that the site of metastasis was determined by the location of the vascular and lymphatic channels which drain the primary tumor. Patients with primary tumors that were drained by vessels leading to the lung would eventually develop lung metastases. Today, we know that both theories contain valuable truths, yet the full story of metastasis is much more complicated than either of the two proposed theories. Factors like the cancer cell's properties and the effectiveness of the immune system in eliminating the cancer cells also play a role in determining the success of metastasis. Unfortunately, many questions about metastasis remain unanswered till today. Understanding the exact mechanism holds an important key to finding a cure for advanced stage cancers. By studying both the genetic and environmental factors which contribute to successful metastasis, we can pinpoint ways to shut down the process. The war against cancer is a constant struggle, and scientists are hard at work developing new methods against metastasis. Of recent interest is immunotherapy, a modality which involves harnessing the power of the immune system to destroy the migrating cells. This can be done in different ways, such as training immune cells to recognize cancerous cells via vaccines. The growth and activity of the immune cells can also be stimulated by injecting man-made interleukins, chemicals which are usually secreted by the immune cells of the body. These two treatments are only the tip of the iceberg. With the collaborated research efforts of governments, companies, and scientists, perhaps the process of metastasis will be stopped for good. Which of these entities has evolved the ability to manipulate an animal many times its size? The answer is all of them. These are all parasites, organisms that live on or inside another host organism, 
which they harm and sometimes even kill. Parasite survival depends on transmitting from one host to the next, sometimes through an intermediate species. Our parasites elegantly achieve this by manipulating their host's behavior, sometimes through direct brain hijacking. For example, this is the Gordian worm. One of its hosts, this cricket. The Gordian worm needs water to mate, but the cricket prefers dry land. So once it's big enough to reproduce, the worm produces proteins that garble the cricket's navigational system. The confused cricket jumps around erratically, moves closer to water, and eventually leaps in, often drowning in the process. The worm then wriggles out to mate, and its eggs get eaten by little water insects that mature, colonize land, and are in turn eaten by new crickets. And thus, the Gordian worm lives on. And here's the rabies virus, another mind-altering parasite. This virus infects mammals, often dogs, and travels up the animal's nerves to its brain, where it causes inflammation that eventually kills the host. But before it does, it often increases its host's aggressiveness and ramps up the production of rabies-transmitting saliva while making it hard to swallow. These factors make the host more likely to bite another animal and more likely to pass the virus on when it does. And now meet Ophiocordyceps, also known as the zombie fungus. Its host of choice is tropical ants that normally live in treetops. After Ophiocordyceps spores pierce the ant's exoskeleton, they set off convulsions that make the ant fall from the tree. The fungus changes the ant's behavior, compelling it to wander mindlessly until it stumbles onto a plant leaf with the perfect fungal breeding conditions, which it latches onto. The ant then dies, and the fungus parasitizes its body to build a tall, thin stalk from its neck. Within several weeks, the stalk shoots off spores, which turn more ants into six-legged, leaf-seeking zombies. One of humanity's most deadly assailants is a behavior-altering parasite. Though if it's any consolation, it's not our brains that are being hijacked. I'm talking about plasmodium, which causes malaria. This parasite needs mosquitoes to shuttle it between hosts, so it makes them bite more frequently and for longer. There's also evidence that humans infected with malaria are more attractive to mosquitoes, which will bite them and transfer the parasite further. This multi-species system is so effective that there are hundreds of millions of malaria cases every year. And finally, there are cats. Don't worry, there probably aren't any cats living in your body and controlling your thoughts. I mean, probably. But there is a microorganism called toxoplasma that needs both cats and rodents to complete its life cycle. When a rat gets infected by eating cat feces, the parasite changes chemical levels in the rat's brain making it less cautious around the hungry felines, maybe even attracted to them. This makes them easy prey, so these infected rodents get eaten and pass the parasite on. Mind control successful. There's even evidence that the parasite affects human behavior. In most cases, we don't completely understand how these parasites manage their feats of behavior modification. But from what we do know, we can tell that they have a pretty diverse toolbox. Gordian worms seem to affect crickets' brains directly. The malaria parasite, on the other hand, blocks an enzyme that helps the mosquitoes feed, forcing them to bite over and over and over again. The rabies virus may cause that snarling, slobbering behavior by putting the immune system into overdrive. But whatever the method, when you think about how effectively these parasites control the behavior of their hosts, you may wonder, how much of human behavior is actually parasites doing the talking? Since more than half of the species on Earth are parasites, it could be more than we think. The sun is shining.
The birds are singing. It looks like the start of another lovely day. You are walking happily in the park when, achoo! A passing stranger has expelled mucus and saliva from their mouth and nose. You can feel the droplets of moisture land on your skin, but what you can't feel are the thousands or even millions of microscopic germs that have covertly traveled through the air and onto your clothing, hands, and face. As gross as this scenario sounds, it's actually very common for our bodies to be exposed to disease-causing germs. And most of the time, it's not nearly as obvious. Germs are found on almost every surface we come into contact with. When we talk about germs, we're actually referring to many different kinds of microscopic organisms, including bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. But what our germs all have in common is the ability to interact with our bodies and change how we feel and function. Scientists who study infectious diseases have wondered for decades why it is that some of these germs are relatively harmless, while others cause devastating effects and can sometimes be fatal. We still haven't solved the entire puzzle, but what we do know is that the harmfulness or virulence of a germ is a result of evolution. How can it be that the same evolutionary process can produce germs that cause very different levels of harm? The answer starts to become clear if we think about a germ's mode of transmission, which is the strategy it uses to get from one host to the next. A common mode of transmission occurs through the air, like the sneeze you just witnessed. And one germ that uses this method is the rhinovirus, which replicates in our upper airways and is responsible for up to half of all common colds. Now imagine that after the sneeze, one of three hypothetical varieties of rhinovirus, let's call them too much, too little, and just right, has been lucky enough to land on you. These viruses are hardwired to replicate, but because of genetic differences, they will do so at different rates. Too much multiplies very often, making it very successful in the short run. However, this success comes at a cost to you, the host. A quickly replicating virus can cause more damage to your body, making cold symptoms more severe. If you're too sick to leave your home, you don't give the virus any opportunities to jump to a new host. And if the disease should kill you, the virus's own life cycle will end along with yours. Too little, on the other hand, multiplies rarely and causes you little harm in the process. Although this leaves you healthy enough to interact with other potential hosts, the lack of symptoms means you may not sneeze at all. Or if you do, there may be too few viruses in your mucus to infect anyone else. Meanwhile, Just Right has been replicating quickly enough to ensure that you're carrying sufficient amounts of the virus to spread but not so often that you are too sick to get out of bed. And in the end, it's the one that will be most successful at transmitting itself to new hosts and giving rise to the next generation. This describes what scientists call trade-off hypothesis. First developed in the early 1980s, it predicts that germs will evolve to maximize their overall success by achieving a balance between replicating within a host, which causes virulence, and transmission to a new host. In the case of the rhinovirus, The hypothesis predicts that its evolution will favor less virulent forms because it relies on close contact to get to its next victim. For the rhinovirus, a mobile host is a good host, and indeed, that is what we see. While most people experience a runny nose, coughing, and sneezing, the common cold is generally mild and only lasts about a week. It would be great if the story ended there, but germs use many other modes of transmission. For example, the malaria parasite, Plasmodium, is transmitted by mosquitoes. Unlike the rhinovirus, it doesn't need us to be up and about, and may even benefit from harming us since a sick and immobile person is easier for mosquitoes to bite. We would expect germs that depend less on host mobility, like those transmitted by insects, water, or food, to cause more severe symptoms. So what can we do to reduce the harmfulness of infectious diseases? Evolutionary biologist Dr. Paul Ewald has suggested that we can actually direct their evolution through simple disease control methods. By mosquito-proofing houses, establishing clean water systems, or staying home when we get a cold, we can obstruct the transmission strategies of harmful germs while creating a greater dependence on host mobility. So, while traditional methods of trying to eradicate germs may only breed stronger ones in the long run, This innovative approach of encouraging them to evolve milder forms could be a win-win situation. <coughs> well, for the most part.
On September 1, 1953, William Scoville used a hand crank and a cheap drill saw to bore into a young man's skull, cutting away vital pieces of his brain and sucking them out through a metal tube. But this wasn't a scene from a horror film or a gruesome police report. Dr. Scoville was one of the most renowned neurosurgeons of his time, and the young man was Henry Malayson, the famous patient known as H.M., whose case provided amazing insights into how our brains work. As a boy, Henry had cracked his skull in an accident and soon began having seizures, blacking out, and losing control of bodily functions. After enduring years of frequent episodes and even dropping out of high school, the desperate young man had turned to Dr. Scoville, a daredevil known for risky surgeries. Partial lobotomies had been used for decades to treat mental patients, based on the notion that mental functions were strictly localized to corresponding brain areas. Having successfully used them to reduce seizures in psychotics, Scoville decided to remove HM's hippocampus, a part of the limbic system that was associated with emotion, but whose function was unknown. At first glance, the operation had succeeded. HM's seizures virtually disappeared, with no change in personality, and his IQ even improved. But there was one problem. His memory was shot. Besides losing most of his memories from the previous decade, HM was unable to form new ones, forgetting what day it was, repeating comments, and even eating multiple meals in a row. When Scoville informed another expert, Wilder Penfield, of the results, he sent a PhD student named Brenda Milner to study HM at his parents' home, where he now spent his days doing odd chores and watching classic movies for the first time, over and over. What she discovered through a series of tests and interviews didn't just contribute greatly to the study of memory. It redefined what memory even meant. One of Milner's findings shed light on the obvious fact that although HM couldn't form new memories, he still retained information long enough from moment to moment to finish a sentence or find the bathroom. When Milner gave him a random number, he managed to remember it for 15 minutes by repeating it to himself constantly. But only five minutes later, he forgot the test had even taken place. Neuroscientists had thought of memory as monolithic, all of it essentially the same, and stored throughout the brain. Milner's results were not only the first clue for the now familiar distinction between short-term and long-term memory, but showed that each uses different brain regions. We now know that memory formation involves several steps. After immediate sensory data is temporarily transcribed by neurons in the cortex, it travels to the hippocampus, where special proteins work to strengthen the cortical synaptic connections. If the experience was strong enough or we recall it periodically in the first few days, the hippocampus then transfers the memory back to the cortex for permanent storage. HM's mind could form the initial impressions, but without a hippocampus to perform this memory consolidation, they eroded like messages scrawled in sand. But this was not the only memory distinction Milner found. In a now famous experiment, she asked HM to trace a third star in the narrow space between the outlines of two concentric ones, while he could only see his paper and pencil through a mirror. Like anyone else performing such an awkward task for the first time, he did horribly. But surprisingly, he improved over repeated trials, even though he had no memory of previous attempts. His unconscious motor centers remembered what the conscious mind had forgotten. What Milner had discovered was that the declarative memory of names, dates, and facts is different from the procedural memory of riding a bicycle or signing your name. And we now know that procedural memory relies more on the basal ganglia and cerebellum, structures that were intact in HM's brain. This distinction between knowing that and knowing how has underpinned all memory research since. HM died at the age of 82 after a mostly peaceful life in a nursing home. Over the years, he had been examined by more than 100 neuroscientists, making his the most studied mind in history. Upon his death, his brain was preserved and scanned before being cut into over 2,000 individual slices and photographed to form a digital map down to the level of individual neurons, all in a live broadcast watched by 400,000 people. Though HM spent most of his life forgetting things, 
he and his contributions to our understanding of memory will be remembered for generations to come. Diabetes mellitus has been a scourge of the developed world with an estimated 400 million people worldwide suffering from this disease and 50% more predicted within 20 years. Its early symptoms, which include increased thirst and large volumes of urine, were recognized as far back as 1500 BCE in Egypt. While the term diabetes, meaning to pass through, was first used in 250 BCE by the Greek physician Apollonius of Memphis, Type 1 and type 2 diabetes, associated respectively with youth and obesity, were identified as separate conditions by Indian physicians somewhere in the 5th century CE. But despite the disease being known, a diagnosis of diabetes in a human patient would remain tantamount to a death sentence until the early 20th century, its causes unknown. What changed this dire situation was the help of humanity's longtime animal partner, Canis lupus familiaris, domesticated from gray wolves thousands of years ago. In 1890, the German scientists von Mehring and Minkowski demonstrated that removing a dog's pancreas caused it to develop all the signs of diabetes, thus establishing the organ's central role in the disease. But the exact mechanism by which this occurred remained a mystery until 1920, when a young Canadian surgeon named Frederick Banting and his student Charles Best advanced the findings of their German colleagues. Working under Professor McLeod at the University of Toronto, they confirmed that the pancreas was responsible for regulating blood glucose, successfully treating diabetic dogs by injecting them with an extract they had prepared from pancreas tissue. By 1922, the researchers working with biochemist James Collip were able to develop a similar extract from beef pancreas to first treat a 14-year-old diabetic boy, followed by six additional patients. The manufacturing process for this extract, now known as insulin, was eventually turned over to a pharmaceutical company that makes different types of injectable insulin to this day. Banting and McLeod received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1923 for their discovery, but Banting chose to share his portion with Charles Best for his help in the initial studies involving dogs. But while medical experimentation on animals remains controversial, in this case at least, it was not just a matter of exploiting dogs for human needs. Dogs develop diabetes at the rate of two cases per 1,000 dogs, almost the same as that of humans under 20. Most canine cases are of type 1 diabetes, similar to the type that young children develop following immune system destruction of the pancreas, and genetic studies have shown that the dog disease has many similar hallmarks of the human disease. This has allowed veterinarians to turn the tables, successfully using insulin to treat diabetes in man's best friend for over 60 years. Many dog owners commit to managing their dog's diabetes with insulin injected twice daily, regimented feedings, and periodic blood measurements using the same home testing glucose monitors used by human patients. And if the purified pig insulin commonly used for dogs fails to work for a particular dog, the vet may even turn to a formulation of human insulin, bringing the process full circle. After all that dogs have done for us throughout the ages, including their role in a medical discovery that has saved countless human lives. Using that same knowledge to help them is the least we could do. What do horror movies and comedies have in common? The two genres might seem totally different, but the reason they're both so popular is perhaps because of what they have in common, their use of dramatic irony. First, let's clarify. There are three types of irony out there. Situational irony is when you expect one thing but get the opposite. Verbal irony is when someone says something but truly means the opposite. Dramatic irony, though, is what we'll be looking at right now. Dramatic irony is when the audience seems to know more about an event 
a situation, or a conversation than the characters in the movie, on the show, or in the book do. The audience is in on a secret that the characters have missed. This is a great storytelling device that creates tremendous emotion within that text. Think about it for a moment. How does it feel when, in a horror film, you know that the scary villain is hiding behind that door in the darkened room? The music becomes eerie. The lighting creates complete shadows. This has to be bad for the hero. Of course, though, that hero must enter the room to find the villain. You feel tremendous tension and the suspense of knowing that someone will jump out and be scary, but you just don't know when. That tension is dramatic irony. You know something more than the characters in the film. Now, take the typical comedy. There will probably be some type of misunderstanding. Again, we know more of what is going on than the characters do. Picture two characters making a plan for a birthday surprise for their roommate, while that roommate overhears the entire conversation from the hallway. From there, confusion and misunderstanding occur, and the tension builds. But this isn't the same tension as the horror film, since it is probably pretty funny as the characters try to figure out the who's and the what's, but it serves as a great example of the tension and suspense of dramatic irony. This tension or suspense in both genres drives the story and keeps the plot progressing. The audience wants, no, needs, to see the tension of the dramatic irony broken either by the scary person jumping out of the shadows or by someone finally revealing someone's true identity and clearing up the confusion. So when you feel like you are in on a secret, that is dramatic irony. A hallmark of all the great writers from Shakespeare to Hitchcock. When the infamous fictional character Carrie White left her high school prom hall ablaze and brought terror upon her town, she relied on her powers of telekinesis, the ability to manipulate physical objects using the power of the mind alone. But while Carrie is just a fictional film based upon a fictional book, belief in telekinesis isn't fictional at all. For centuries, humans have claimed they really do have the power to control the motion of objects using only their minds. Levitation, opening doors at will, and spoon bending are all intriguing examples. It happens in the Matrix when Neo freezes bullets midair, and it's a skill that Yoda has honed to a T. But is telekinesis real or just as fictional as Carrie, Yoda, and Neo combined? To investigate, we need to evaluate telekinetic claims through a scientific lens using the scientific method. Telekinesis is part of the discipline called parapsychology, in which researchers study psychic phenomena. Parapsychologists regard what they do as a science, but other scientists disagree. Let's start with a few basic observations. Observation number one. While there are loads of anecdotes out there about telekinesis, there's no scientific proof that it exists. No studies conducted according to the scientific method and repeated under lab conditions can show that it's real. In the 1930s, the so-called father of parapsychology, Joseph Banks Rhine, tested in the lab whether people could use telekinesis to make a dice roll the way they wanted it to. But afterwards, scientists couldn't replicate his results, and since replication is key to proving an idea, that was a problem. Aside from scientists, there are also countless self-proclaimed telekinetics, but all have been exposed as tricksters or can't perform under conditions where they're not totally in control, suggesting that they manipulate the situation to get the results they want. Today, there's even a huge stash of prize money available from lots of organizations for anyone who can prove that psychic abilities, like telekinesis, are real. But these riches remain unclaimed. Observation number two. When we investigate telekinesis, there's no consensus about what exactly is being measured. Are powerful Yoda-like brainwaves at work, perhaps? Since nobody agrees, it's difficult to apply a research standard, something required in all other types of science to test the validity of ideas. Observation number three. The point of science is to discover the unknown, 
And in the history of scientific investigation, it's definitely happened that new discoveries have gone against established science and even overturned whole branches of science. Such discoveries must be proven extra carefully to withstand skepticism. In the case of telekinesis, the idea goes against established science, but lacks the powerful evidence in favor of it. Our universe is controlled and explained by the laws of physics, and one of these laws tells us that brain waves can't control objects because they're neither strong nor far-reaching enough to influence anything outside of our skulls. Physics also tells us that the only forces that can influence objects from afar are magnetic and gravitational. Probably the closest thing to telekinesis that science can explain is the use of thoughts to control a robotic arm. In the brains of stroke patients who can't move, researchers can implant tiny wires into the region that controls movement and then train the patient to concentrate on moving a robotic arm, which acts like an extension of their minds. And it works. It's amazing, but it isn't telekinesis. The patient's thoughts aren't just vague, undetectable things. They're measurable brain signals, translated through wires into a robot. Science can measure, test, and explain the motion, and that's how we've shown that this kind of mind control is real. Science is a slow process of accumulating the evidence that either stands for or against an idea. When we stack up evidence, we can see which tower grows tallest. And in the case of telekinesis, it's not the tower showing that it exists. Some say this mystical phenomenon can't fit within the confines of science, and that's okay. But then telekinesis becomes purely a matter of personal conviction. If something can't be assessed scientifically, then it can't be described as scientific either. So the results of our investigation reveal that however much we may want to believe that the force really is within us, the case for telekinesis remains weak. Sorry, Neo, Carrie, and Yoda. Your skills are mind-blowing, but for now, they belong in the movies. Some of the issues that are important if you want to have people in space for long periods of time, one is that people will tend to lose bone and muscle mass. We know this if you have put a cast on your leg you'll, and you take the cast off after a few weeks, you'll see that your muscles have shrunk in size. And if you measured the bone strength, you'd also see that that might have gone down a little bit too. And so it's very interesting that our body has that ability to adapt to the loads that are put on it so that bones and muscles aren't static, they're always changing. Well, we think of bone as being a solid thing that doesn't change very much, it changes too. And it turns out that in weightlessness, you lose bone. And then you also will cause the muscles that work against gravity, the uh, what are called the postural muscles, they'll start to shrink and lose strength. There are other things in the cardiovascular system, the heart and blood vessels. And if you think about it, standing up in gravity means you have to work against gravity in order to keep blood pumping to your head. So if you couldn't keep blood pumping to the head, you'd, you'd pass out every time you stood up. Because when you're lying down, you don't have to push against gravity. But when you stand up, you got to work against gravity to keep blood flowing to your head. And your heart and blood vessels have a really nicely worked out system to make that happen every time. But that system can also change uh, in weightlessness. And then the other area that changes is the system that has to do with balance. Again, maintaining your balance is something that you're doing against gravity, right? If you didn't have gravity present, you wouldn't have to worry about falling. <laughs> but you obviously do have to worry about falling, and we have a very highly developed sense of balance to keep us upright and to prevent us from falling. And when you see what skaters do, you realize just how exquisite a system it is. But when you go into weightlessness, your balance system changes. You don't really notice it while you're in weightlessness, but when you come back, you do notice it, that your balance has changed and you have a little bit of trouble maintaining your balance. And what it shows is that while you're in space, your brain is trying to allow you to function in weightlessness, and so it readapts you to being weightless, which you don't notice until you come back and find out that you're now back on Earth with a balance system that's been adapted to space. You know, all life 
developed here on Earth with gravity being present. So life evolved under the influence of gravity. And then we grow up with gravity being present. So we learn how to walk and catch a ball and ice skate or whatever, all with gravity being present. Now what if you were to grow up without gravity? What about the systems that depend on gravity, like your muscles or your balance system or the heart and blood vessels? Would they develop normally or would they be different in some way? One reason why you might think that it would go down a different pathway is from a, an experiment that was done uh, some time ago by two neuroscientists called Hubel and Weisel. And what they did is they had a kitten and they put a patch over the eye of the kitten and then the kitten grew up to be a cat and they removed the patch. And so the question is, can the cat see out of that eye? Now there's nothing wrong with the eye, right? But it just hasn't seen anything. There's no, been, hasn't been any light coming in. And the answer is, is that the cat can't see out of that eye. Because what happens is that the brain goes down a different pathway when it develops, and the connections that would ordinarily develop to that eye don't develop. And that can't be undone. That's a permanent change. So the brain of that cat is fundamentally different from the brain of a cat that grew up seeing out of that eye. That cat grew up with a, a different brain, in essence. So then you wonder, well, what about gravity? What if you don't have the forces that gravity produces? Is your balance organ going to develop in the same way? Or will it be different? If somebody grew up in space, could they come back to Earth and function? Or would they really be a different person? Have you ever noticed something swimming in your field of vision? It may look like a tiny worm or a transparent blob. And whenever you try to get a closer look, it disappears, only to reappear as soon as you shift your glance. But don't go rinsing out your eyes. What you are seeing is a common phenomenon known as a floater. The scientific name for these objects is Muscae volitantis, Latin for flying flies. And true to their name, they can be somewhat annoying. But they're not actually bugs or any kind of external objects at all. Rather, they exist inside your eyeball. Floaters may seem to be alive since they move and change shape, but they are not alive. Floaters are tiny objects that cast shadows on the retina, the light-sensitive tissue at the back of your eye. They might be bits of tissue, red blood cells, or clumps of protein. And because they're suspended, Within the vitreous humor, the gel-like liquid that fills the inside of your eye, floaters drift along with your eye movements and seem to bounce a little when your eye stops. Floaters may be only barely distinguishable most of the time. They become more visible the closer they are to the retina, just as holding your hand closer to a table with an overhead light will result in a more sharply defined shadow. And floaters are particularly noticeable when you are looking at a uniform bright surface, like a blank computer screen, snow, or a clear sky, where the consistency of the background makes them easier to distinguish. The brighter the light is, the more your pupil contracts. This has an effect similar to replacing a large diffuse light fixture with a single overhead light bulb, which also makes the shadow appear clearer. There is another visual phenomenon that looks similar to floaters, but is in fact unrelated. If you've seen tiny dots of light darting about when looking at a bright blue sky, you've experienced what is known as the blue field entoptic phenomenon. In some ways, this is the opposite of seeing floaters. Here, you are not seeing shadows, but little moving windows letting light through to your retina. The windows are actually caused by white blood cells moving through the capillaries along your retina surface. These leukocytes can be so large that they nearly fill a capillary, causing a plasma space to open up in front of them. Because the space and the white blood cells are both more transparent to blue light than the red blood cells normally present in capillaries, 
We see a moving dot of light wherever this happens, following the paths of your capillaries and moving in time with your pulse. Under ideal viewing conditions, you might even see what looks like a dark tail following the dot. This is the red blood cells that have bunched up behind the leukocyte. Some science museums have an exhibit which consists of a screen of blue light, allowing you to see these blue sky sprites much more clearly than you normally would. While everybody's eyes experience these sort of effects, the number and type vary greatly. In the case of floaters, they often go unnoticed as our brain learns to ignore them. However, abnormally numerous or large floaters that interfere with vision may be a sign of a more serious condition, requiring immediate medical treatment. But the majority of the time, entoptic phenomena, such as floaters and blue sky sprites, are just a gentle reminder that what we think we see depends just as much on our biology and minds as it does on the external world. In 1796, the scientist Edward Jenner injected material from a cowpox virus into an eight-year-old boy, with a hunch that this would provide the protection needed to save people from deadly outbreaks of the related smallpox virus. It was a success. The eight-year-old was inoculated against the disease, and this became the first-ever vaccine. But why did it work? To understand how vaccines function, we need to know how the immune system defends us against contagious diseases in the first place. When foreign microbes invade us, the immune system triggers a series of responses in an attempt to identify and remove them from our bodies. The signs that this immune response is working are the coughing, sneezing, inflammation, and fever we experience which work to trap, deter, and rid the body of threatening things like bacteria. These innate immune responses also trigger our second line of defense, called adaptive immunity. Special cells called B cells and T cells are recruited to fight microbes and also record information about them, creating a memory of what the invaders look like and how best to fight them. This know-how becomes handy if the same pathogen invades the body again. But despite this smart response, there's still a risk involved. The body takes time to learn how to respond to pathogens and to build up these defenses. And even then, if a body is too weak or young to fight back when it's invaded, it might face very serious risk if the pathogen is particularly severe. But what if we could prepare the body's immune response? readying it before someone even got ill. This is where vaccines come in. Using the same principles that the body uses to defend itself, scientists use vaccines to trigger the body's adaptive immune system without exposing humans to the full-strength disease. This has resulted in many vaccines, which each work uniquely, separated into many different types. First, we have live attenuated vaccines. These are made of the pathogen itself, but a much weaker and tamer version. Next, we have inactive vaccines, in which the pathogens have been killed. The weakening and inactivation in both types of vaccine ensures that pathogens don't develop into the full-blown disease. But just like a disease, they trigger an immune response, teaching the body to recognize an attack by making a profile of pathogens in preparation. The downside is that live attenuated vaccines can be difficult to make, and because they're live and quite powerful, people with weaker immune systems can't have them, while inactive vaccines don't create long-lasting immunity. Another type, the subunit vaccine, is only made from one part of the pathogen, called an antigen, the ingredient that actually triggers the immune response. By even further isolating specific components of antigens, like proteins or polysaccharides, these vaccines can prompt specific responses. Scientists are now building a whole new range of vaccines called DNA vaccines. For this variety, they isolate the very genes that make the specific antigens the body needs to trigger its immune response to specific pathogens. When injected into the human body, 
Those genes instruct cells in the body to make the antigens. This causes a stronger immune response and prepares the body for any future threats. And because the vaccine only includes specific genetic material, it doesn't contain any other ingredients from the rest of the pathogen that could develop into the disease and harm the patient. If these vaccines become a success, we might be able to build more effective treatments for invasive pathogens in years to come. Just like Edward Jenner's amazing discovery spurred on modern medicine all those decades ago, continuing the development of vaccines might even allow us to treat diseases like HIV, malaria, or Ebola one day. For as far back as we can trace our existence, humans have been fascinated with death and resurrection. Nearly every religion in the world has some interpretation of them, and from our earliest myths to the latest cinematic blockbusters, the dead keep coming back. But is resurrection really possible? And what is the actual difference between a living creature and a dead body anyway? To understand what death is, we need to understand what life is. One ancient theory was an idea called vitalism, which claimed that living things were unique because they were filled with a special substance or energy that was the essence of life. Whether it was called chi, lifeblood, or humors, the belief in such an essence was common throughout the world and still persists in the stories of creatures who can somehow drain life from others or some form of magical sources that can replenish it. Vitalism began to fade in the Western world following the scientific revolution in the 17th century. René Descartes advanced the notion that the human body was essentially no different from any other machine, brought to life by a divinely created soul located in the brain's pineal gland. And in 1907, Dr. Duncan McDougall even claimed that the soul had mass weighing patients immediately before and after death in an attempt to prove it. Though his experiments were discredited, much like the rest of vitalism, traces of his theory still come up in popular culture. But where do all these discredited theories leave us? What we now know is that life is not contained in some magical substance or spark, but within the ongoing biological processes themselves. And to understand these processes, we need to zoom down to the level of our individual cells. Inside each of these cells, chemical reactions are constantly occurring, powered by the glucose and oxygen that our bodies convert into the energy-carrying molecule known as ATP. Cells use this energy for everything from repair to growth to reproduction. Not only does it take a lot of energy to make the necessary molecules, but it takes even more to get them where they need to be. The universal phenomenon of entropy means that molecules will tend towards diffusing randomly, moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration, or even breaking apart into smaller molecules and atoms. So cells must constantly keep entropy in check by using energy to maintain their molecules in the very complicated formations necessary for biological functions to occur. The breaking down of these arrangements when the entire cell succumbs to entropy is what eventually results in death. This is the reason that organisms can't be simply sparked back to life once they've already died. We can pump air into someone's lungs, but it won't do much good if the many other processes involved in the respiratory cycle are no longer functioning. Similarly, the electric shock from a defibrillator doesn't jumpstart an inanimate heart but resynchronizes the muscle cells in an abnormally beating heart so they regain their normal rhythm. This can prevent a person from dying, but it won't raise a dead body, or a monster sewn together from dead bodies. So it would seem that all our various medical miracles can delay or prevent death, but not reverse it. But that's not as simple as it sounds, because constant advancements in technology and medicine have resulted in diagnoses such as coma, describing potentially reversible conditions under which people would have previously been considered dead. 
In the future, the point of no return may be pushed even further. Some animals are known to extend their lifespans or survive extreme conditions by slowing down their biological processes to the point where they are virtually paused. And research into cryonics hopes to achieve the same by freezing dying people and reviving them later when newer technology is able to help them. See, if the cells are frozen, there's very little molecular movement, and diffusion practically stops. Even if all of a person's cellular processes had already broken down, this could still conceivably be reversed by a swarm of nanobots, moving all the molecules back to their proper positions and injecting all of the cells with ATP at the same time, presumably causing the body to simply pick up where it left off. So if we think of life not as some magical spark, but a state of incredibly complex, self-perpetuating organization, death is just the process of increasing entropy that destroys this fragile balance. And the point at which someone is completely dead turns out not to be a fixed constant, but simply a matter of how much of this entropy we're currently capable of reversing. Sadness is part of the human experience, but for centuries there has been vast disagreement over exactly what it is and what, if anything, to do about it. In its simplest terms, sadness is often thought of as the natural reaction to a difficult situation. You feel sad when a friend moves away, or when a pet dies. When a friend says, I'm sad, you often respond by asking, what happened? But your assumption, that sadness has an external cause outside the self is a relatively new idea. Ancient Greek doctors didn't view sadness that way. They believed it was a dark fluid inside the body. According to their humoral system, the human body and soul were controlled by four fluids, known as humors, and their balance directly influenced a person's health and temperament. Melancholia comes from melina kole, the word for black bile, the humor believed to cause sadness. By changing your diet and through medical practices, you could bring your humors into balance. Even though we now know much more about the systems that govern the human body, these Greek ideas about sadness resonate with current views not on the sadness we all occasionally feel, but on clinical depression. Doctors believe that certain kinds of long-term, unexplained emotional states are at least partially related to brain chemistry the balance of various chemicals present inside the brain. Like the Greek system, changing the balance of these chemicals can deeply alter how we respond to even extremely difficult circumstances. There's also a long tradition of attempting to discern the value of sadness. And in that discussion, you'll find a strong argument that sadness is not only an inevitable part of life, but an essential one. If you've never felt melancholy, you've missed out on part of what it means to be human. Many thinkers contend that melancholy is necessary in gaining wisdom. Robert Burton, born in 1577, spent his life studying the causes and experience of sadness. In his masterpiece, The Anatomy of Melancholy, Burton wrote, He that increaseth wisdom increaseth sorrow. The romantic poets of the early 19th century believed melancholy allows us to more deeply understand other profound emotions like beauty and joy. To understand the sadness of the trees losing their leaves in the fall is to more fully understand the cycle of life that brings flowers in the spring. But wisdom and emotional intelligence seem pretty high on the hierarchy of needs. Does sadness have value on a more basic, tangible, maybe even evolutionary level? Scientists think that crying and feeling withdrawn is what originally helped our ancestors secure social bonds and help them get the support they needed. Sadness, as opposed to anger or violence, was an expression of suffering that could immediately bring people closer to the suffering person, and this helped both the person and the larger community to thrive. Perhaps sadness helped generate the unity we needed to survive, but many have wondered whether the suffering felt by others is anything like the suffering we experience ourselves. The poet Emily Dickinson wrote, 
I measure every grief I meet with narrow, probing eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has an easier size. And in the 20th century, medical anthropologists like Arthur Kleinman gathered evidence from the way people talk about pain to suggest that emotions aren't universal at all, and that culture, particularly the way we use language, can influence how we feel. When we talk about heartbreak, the feeling of brokenness becomes part of our experience, whereas in a culture that talks about a bruised heart, there actually seems to be a different subjective experience. Some contemporary thinkers aren't interested in sadness's subjectivity versus universality, and would rather use technology to eliminate suffering in all its forms. David Pierce has suggested that genetic engineering and other contemporary processes can not only alter the way humans experience emotional and physical pain, but that world ecosystems ought to be redesigned so that animals don't suffer in the wild. He calls his project Paradise Engineering. But is there something sad about a world without sadness? Our cavemen ancestors and favorite poets might not want any part of such a paradise. In fact, the only things about sadness that seem universally agreed upon are that it has been felt by most people throughout time, and that for thousands of years, one of the best ways we have to deal with this difficult emotion is to articulate it, to try to express what feels inexpressible. In the words of Emily Dickinson, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. In the summer of 1976, a mysterious epidemic suddenly struck two Central African towns, killing the majority of its victims. Medical researchers suspected the deadly Marburg virus to be the culprit. But what they saw in microscope images was an entirely new pathogen, which would be named after the nearby Ebola River. Like yellow fever or dengue, the disease caused by the Ebola virus is a severe type of hemorrhagic fever. It begins by attacking the immune system's cells and neutralizing its responses, allowing the virus to proliferate. Starting anywhere from 2 to 20 days after contraction, initial symptoms like high temperature, aching, and sore throat resemble those of a typical flu, but quickly escalate to vomiting, rashes, and diarrhea. And as the virus spreads, it invades the lymph nodes and vital organs such as kidneys and liver, causing them to lose function. But the virus itself is not what kills Ebola victims. Instead, the mounting cell deaths trigger an immune system overload, known as a cytokine storm, an explosion of immune responses that damages blood vessels, causing both internal and external bleeding. The excessive fluid loss and resulting complications can be fatal within 6 to 16 days of the first symptoms. Though proper care and rehydration therapy can significantly reduce mortality rates in patients. Fortunately, while Ebola is highly virulent, several factors limit its contagiousness. Unlike viruses that proliferate through small airborne particles, Ebola only exists in bodily fluids such as saliva, blood, mucus, vomit, or feces. In order to spread, these must be transmitted from an infected person into another's body through passageways such as the eyes, mouth, or nose. And because the disease's severity increases directly along with the viral load, even an infected person is unlikely to be contagious until they have begun to show symptoms. While Ebola has been shown to survive on surfaces for several hours, and transmission through sneezing or coughing is theoretically possible, Virtually all known cases of contraction have been through direct contact with the severely ill, with the greatest risk posed to medical workers and friends or relatives of the victims. This is why, despite its horrifying effects, Ebola has been far less deadly overall than more common infections, such as measles, malaria, or even influenza. Once an outbreak has been contained, 
the virus does not exist in the human population until the next outbreak begins. But while this is undoubtedly a good thing, it also makes Ebola difficult to study. Scientists believe fruit bats to be its natural carriers, but just how it is transmitted to humans remains unknown. Furthermore, many of the countries where Ebola outbreaks occur suffer from poor infrastructure and sanitation, which enables the disease to spread, and the poverty of these regions, combined with the relatively low amount of overall cases, means there is little economic incentive for drug companies to invest in research. Though some experimental medicines have shown promise, and governments are funding development of a vaccine, as of 2014, the only widespread and effective solutions to an Ebola outbreak remain isolation, sanitation, and information. There is an environmental mystery afoot, and it begins with a seemingly trivial detail that reveals a disaster of global proportions. One day, you notice that the honey you slather on your morning toast is more expensive. Instead of switching to jam, you investigate the reason for the price hike. What you find is shocking. The number of domesticated honeybees in the U.S. has been decreasing at an alarming rate. This decline appears too big to be explained by the usual causes of bee death alone, disease, parasites, or starvation. The typical crime scene has almost no adult bees left in the hive, except perhaps a lonely queen and a few other survivors. It's full of untouched food stores and a brood of unborn larvae, suggesting that the adults vacated without waiting for them to hatch. But what's particularly eerie is that there is no telltale mass of dead or dying bees nearby. Either they have forgotten their way back to the hive, or they have simply disappeared. These mysterious disappearances aren't new. Humans have been collecting honey for centuries. But it wasn't until European settlers in the 1600s introduced the subspecies Apis mellifera that we domesticated bees. Since the 19th century, beekeepers have recorded occasional mass disappearances, giving them enigmatic names like disappearing disease, spring dwindle disease, and autumn collapse. But when in 2006 such losses were found to affect more than half of all hives in the US, the phenomenon got a new name, Colony Collapse Disorder. The most frightening thing about this mystery isn't that we'll have to go back to using regular sugar in our tea. We farm bees for their honey, but they also pollinate our crops on an industrial scale, generating over a third of America's food production this way. So, how can we find the culprit behind this calamity? Here are three of the possible offenders. Exhibit A, pests and disease. Most infamous is the Varroa mite, a minuscule red pest that not only invades colonies and feeds on bees, but also transfers pathogens that stunt bee growth and shortens their lifespan. Exhibit B, genetics. The queen is the core of a healthy hive. But nowadays, the millions of queen bees distributed in commercial hives are bred from just a few original queens, which raises the worry about a lack of genetic diversity which could weaken bees' defenses against pathogens and pests. Exhibit C. Chemicals. Pesticides used both on commercial beehives and agricultural crops to ward off parasites could be getting into the food and water that honeybees consume. Researchers have even found that some pesticides damage the honeybees' homing abilities. So we have a file full of clues, but no clear leads. In reality, scientists, the actual detectives on this case, face disagreement over what causes colony collapse disorder. For now, we assume that several factors are the cause. Honeybees aren't necessarily in danger of extinction, but fewer bees overall means less pollination and higher food costs. So it's crucial that scientists solve the case of the vanishing bees. Because while having less honey might be a buzzkill, Crop shortages are something that would truly sting.
Nestled in the tissues of your neck is a small, unassuming organ that wields enormous power over your body. It's called the thyroid. Like the operations manager in a company, its role is to make sure that the cells in your body are working properly. It does that by using hormones to deliver messages to every single one of them. This high-ranking organ is made up of lobules that each contain smaller cells called follicles, which store the hormones the thyroid sends out into your blood. Two of the most important hormones it produces are thyroxine and triiodothyronine, or T3 and T4. As messengers, the hormone's job is to instruct every cell in the body when to consume oxygen and nutrients. That maintains the body's metabolism, the series of reactions our cells perform to provide us with energy. This hormonal notification from the thyroid gets the heart pumping more efficiently and makes our cells break down nutrients faster. When you need more energy, the thyroid helps by sending out hormones to increase metabolism. Ultimately, the thyroid allows our cells to use energy, grow, and reproduce. The thyroid is controlled by the pituitary gland, a hormonal gland deep in the brain that oversees the thyroid's tasks, making sure it knows when to send out its messengers. The pituitary's role is to sense if hormone levels in the blood are too low or too high, in which case it sends out instructions in the form of the thyroid-stimulating hormone. Even in this tightly controlled system, however, management sometimes slips up. Certain diseases, growths in the thyroid, or chemical imbalances in the body can confuse the organ and make it deaf to the pituitary's guiding commands. The first problem this causes is hyperthyroidism, which happens when the organ sends out too many hormones. That means the cells are overloaded with instructions to consume nutrients and oxygen. They become overactive as a result, meaning a person with hyperthyroidism experiences a higher metabolism, signaled by a faster heartbeat, constant hunger, and rapid weight loss. They also feel hot, sweaty, anxious, and find it difficult to sleep. The opposite problem is hypothyroidism, which happens when the thyroid sends out too few hormones, meaning the body's cells don't have as many messengers to guide them. In response, cells grow listless and metabolism slows. People with hypothyroidism see symptoms in weight gain, sluggishness, sensitivity to cold, swollen joints, and feeling low. Luckily, there are medical treatments that can help trigger the thyroid's activities again and bring the body back to a steady metabolic rate. For such a little organ, the thyroid wields an awful lot of power, but a healthy thyroid manages our cells so effectively that it can keep us running smoothly without us even noticing it's there.